Despite every instinct screaming, do not go up those stairs. The group pressed on, and the quiet sobbing became louder. The ranger, who was scouting up ahead, tried to turn around and warn his allies not to come any closer, but no sound would leave his mouth. In fact, the only sound he could hear was his own voice beckoning the party closer. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we scour old source books of editions past to find monsters and convert them for your D&D game. Today we're going to mix things up a little bit and we're actually taking a look at a creature from Pathfinder, which I've wanted to do a video on for a really long time. I am of course talking about the Attic Whisperer, which can be found in Pathfinder's Bestiary 2. Today we're going to talk about what this thing is, how it does battle, and of course some ways for you to bring it into your world. So to start things off, let's talk about just exactly what we're dealing with here. The Attic Whisperer's story is not only a sad one, but incredibly creepy. These creatures manifest after the death of a particularly lonely or neglected child. But what makes them different is instead of just raising as an angry spirit or some kind of zombie, they manifest some sort of body out of dust, old discarded toys, and other trinkets that may have been associated with whoever the creature was in life. When it first forms, it doesn't even necessarily have the trademark skull atop its body. After a while, it usually seeks out the skull of some sort of small woodland animal like a fox and uses it as almost a decoration. The Attic Whisperer doesn't really rely on strength when it comes to combat. In fact, it's actually quite fragile. To be effective, it relies on stealth, tactics, and the supernatural abilities granted to it in death. The first of these supernatural powers is called Steel Breath. Whenever the Attic Whisperer makes a bite attack against a creature, as the name suggests, that creature needs to make a save or it has some of its breath stolen. Essentially what this means is that the creature gains one level of exhaustion. If it takes another one of these bite attacks, it gains another level of exhaustion. If the creature takes a few more attacks and fails more than two saves, it then falls into a magical sleep. The sleeping creature does not wake up from this sleep. Ever. Unless, of course, the Attic Whisperer is killed, or some sort of spell like Dispel Magic or Remove Cursed is cast on the creature by one of its allies. The actual bite attack itself doesn't really do all that much damage, however, falling asleep, especially permanently like this, is basically just taking somebody out of combat. The other thing to consider here too is the exhaustion effect. It can be pretty detrimental in combat, and especially if you're making all those saves at a disadvantage now, it's going to be much harder for them to stay awake. The other nasty trick that an Attic Whisperer can pull is called Steel Voice, and it is definitely their most infamous ability. The Attic Whisperer can opt to make a ghostly touch attack rather than bite its target. And rather than causing exhaustion, if the target fails its save, its voice is stolen for one hour. This means the affected creature cannot talk, they cannot use spells that require verbal components, and they can't use any magical abilities or items that require some kind of command word or anything like that. In turn, the Attic Whisperer can then mimic the stolen voice flawlessly. It also knows how to speak any languages the stolen voice knows how to speak. This is where you have some potential for really creepy shenanigans, especially if you run a group that just loves RP. A really neat thing about this ability though is that once the original creature gets its voice back after the hour has gone by, the Attic Whisperer still retains the ability to mimic that voice, essentially taking the stolen voice and adding it to a library of other stolen voices. Now at first glance, this ability seems to primarily target spellcasters, which to some extent is true, but not being able to talk in combat is a huge deal for anyone, especially if you end up with a couple of players who can't speak. It can have some really interesting implications for your players actually sitting at the table, if they're up for it of course. You could ask the affected player to not speak unless they are telling you, the DM, what they want to do on their turn. By doing this, even out of game, that player will not be able to set up plans or try to decide what they want to do with the rest of the group, at least by speaking. I've done this with players in the past and had them resort to just using hand signals. It can be really interesting. We don't really realize how much we rely on speech for simple things like this until it's gone. Now, the final ability the Attic Whisperer can spring on unsuspecting adventurers is called the Aura of Sobs. At all times, unless the Attic Whisperer chooses to turn it off, essentially, there is an audible aura of crying and whimpering just constantly around this creature. And get this, the ghostly cries 
are actually comprised of all the voices that the Attic Whisperer has stolen from other creatures in the past. Now, while anyone can just hear this sound that's within earshot, if you're within 10 feet of the creature, the childlike whimpering and cries become so intense that it actually imposes disadvantage on all attack rolls and saves. Mechanically, this is a really great complement to the Whisperer's other abilities. RP-wise, it adds a lot of flavor to the encounter. This may just be me personally, but I find it really hard to make interesting encounters that are undead-centric at the lower levels. All we really have are zombies and some ghosts. That is part of the reason I love this creature so much. It has excellent flavor, offers a lot of really interesting combat tricks, and will make your players ask a lot of questions which they will definitely not like the answers to. For example, the very location of the Attic Whisperer should tell a story in and of itself. Typical locations might include an old abandoned orphanage, or the ruins of a noble house, or possibly the sewers underneath a particularly dilapidated part of town. Part of the key here too is you want to set the Attic Whisperer up in an environment where it can use its hit and run tactics. This monster will not last long in a straight up fight, and I'm sure it knows that as well. So any location that it can dart out of the shadows, strike the enemy, and then get back into a pile of rubble or whatever it's hiding in is going to be ideal. The other thing to consider here too is that the Attic Whisperer probably isn't going to be alone. In fact, just by its very nature, it should detest being alone. You could set it up as the boss monster of the encounter and have it in command of some dire rats or some other type of lowly vermin. The other thing that's neat about this monster too is if you're DMing for a higher level game, rather than use it as the boss monster or the big encounter, you could have your players go up in an encounter that's five or six of these things and they're just fighting them all at the same time. I mean sure they're going to be able to take one down with just one or two hits, they're not very strong, but they don't have to kill the players to win, they just have to make them fail their saves enough until they all fall asleep. Permanently. As for building up the encounter so that your players actually have any reason to go to one of these locations we talked about where they will find an Attic Whisperer, you've actually got a couple options here. Now obviously it's easy to just drop this creature into a horror centric campaign, but if that's not the kind of game you're running, you could always have part of the amalgamation of objects making up the creature be some important item that your players need to retrieve. Maybe the players are contracted out by some noble from a fallen house who wants the players to go back to his old family's estate and retrieve some kind of object, maybe a sacred ring that will then prove that he is who he says he is, at least in the eyes of the other nobles. So the party heads out to find this ring, easy task, but unfortunately they come to the realization that this ring is in fact part of the Attic Whisperer's body. And maybe the voices that it's stolen from the past or even the voices of its other family members that it haunted after it died from whatever situation brought it to that state. You could get up to all sorts of tension building tricks here, and it could make for a really intense encounter. Even just as a random encounter though, the Attic Whisperer has so much potential. Imagine if during the night's rest, one of the players who's currently on watch gets attacked by the Attic Whisperer and has their voice stolen. At first they would obviously try to yell and wake everyone up since they're under attack, but they can't. So eventually, when they do get to waking everyone up, the party is waking up not only confused, but now there's a faint din of sobbing filling the forest. And one of the voices in this sobbing chorus sounds uncomfortably close to the player's voice who was just attacked. Now as the Attic Whisperer is written in the book, they are super malevolent and are really just beyond help. However, you definitely don't have to stick to what the book says. You could always play it so that maybe instead of fighting it straight up, if the players don't want to, there could be a way to bring peace to the Attic Whisperer and make it feel less lonely, thus allowing it to pass on to the next world. This could be a good option to present to your players if you have some members of the party who might be opposed to striking down a grief-stricken child, even if its soul has been twisted by anger. Although, making it so there truly is no other option could actually prove as a really interesting moral dilemma for your players. Ultimately, no matter what you do, I can guarantee you that in 90% of groups this conversation is going to come up, so it's a good idea to plan ahead and try to think of at least how you want to do it. Now when it comes to changes we can make to this monster, I've actually come up with a couple of ideas. Say that your Attic Whisperer is a very old one, and over the course of its life it's collected hundreds, or in extreme cases, maybe even thousands of voices. So much so that its aura of sobs effect stretches well beyond the initial 10 feet radius that is granted to the base creature. If you're simply looking for a more challenging encounter, you could stretch the aura to 30, 40, 50 feet even. But if you're looking for a major situation, 
Maybe the aura is so big and this creature so ancient that it's actually affecting everyone in an entire town. Perhaps this town just has a general malaise and dour sense to it. If the players choose to press further and investigate this, they might find something interesting in the sewers. Since their bodies are literally made up of objects, you could always have it manifest as this huge being just made up of toys and discarded trinkets left over from the townsfolk above. Or for something a little different, maybe the Attic Whisperer has some sort of magical item as part of its being, thus giving it some supernatural abilities. For example, maybe the Attic Whisperer has a cloak of Misty Step as part of its form, which it wraps itself in. You could then play it like a regular Attic Whisperer, except it can cast Misty Step as a bonus action. This would kind of spice up the encounter a little bit, and it would give your players good cause to fight this thing, because hopefully when they defeat it, they then get to inherit those magic items. That being said though, if you do this, your players are going to expect to be able to take those magic items, so don't give it anything that you don't want your players to have. Now a huge part to running this encounter is the buildup. Don't rush into combat too quickly, or just skip over minor details, because they're ultimately not important. Taking your time to really elaborate and slowly describe everything the players are hearing and sensing in a situation like this is half the fun. Through just the power of description alone, you can turn a good encounter into a great one. All in all, I think the Attic Whisperer is a great addition to almost any D&D campaign, especially if you're running a horror-centric adventure. Even if you just want to run a creepy session, maybe for Halloween or something, or just because, I can't recommend it enough. That is all for today though, so hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about the worst babysitting gig ever. And if you did and you like what I do here, please subscribe to the channel, I have at least one new video every week, and I've also got an announcement to make. For those of you who use Reddit, we now have a subreddit set up. You can find a link to the subreddit and the monster conversion in the description below. The subreddit is pretty empty right now, but it's my hope that we can use it as a tool to start building up the community. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.